event. So if you get opportunity after our meeting, I want you guys to jump on and register. They got a lot of good information out there. So a couple of notes I want to put out before we jump in and I introduce uh, some of these two, uh, these two contractors I work with, but um, I'm going to send out an email. Uh, if you're interested in, in a scholarship to do commercial, uh, Justin Young from uh, Metro Tech, there is a scholarship. Uh, I'm going to send out if you want assistance to get your CCIM uh, to specialize in commercial. Also, um, what's his name now? Um, in the NAACP, if you have been discriminated in the Southern sector, please reach out to me. If you've been discriminated against, your clients have been discriminated against uh, past 30 through a lender, whether it's car, loan, or house, uh, please uh, reach out to me. Uh, Kevin Felders of the NAACP wants to be notified. So reach out to me so I can get that information over to him. All right. Uh, okay. Shantae is not in to introduce new members, but if this is your first time to a NARAP meeting and you or you haven't been here in a while, uh, will you uh, uh, introduce yourself? Not the panelists, just uh, introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Corey Mitchell and uh, I'm with uh, Skylight Home Inspections. Um, I uh, uh, have spoken to Mr. Monty Brown a couple of times before, and uh, he and I have sort of established a, a, a bit of relationship, and he has always extended his hand forward. Um, I had a chance to speak to uh, someone from Green Team Realty yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. Shantae, and she sent me the information and invited me to sit in and thought that it would be a good idea that I would have a chance to meet everybody in the group. So I'm excited to be here, excited to make introductions and get to know everybody. Thank you for having me on this morning. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks for attending, Corey. Anybody else? Um, hi, I'm Luis. Well, you're apparently, you're apparently, you're going to be introduced, Luis. Okay, just want to say hi. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Good morning. My name is Wes Gresham. Good morning, Wes. Very good, very good. I have not attended in uh, some time, I'll put it like that, but I'm certainly uh, happy to be here this morning and to meet and receive information in regards to the investing that is going on. So, and I'm with uh, Keller Williams Realty, South Lake. Anyone else? All right, since we don't have anyone else, uh, I want to get into our panelists. Uh, of the contractors I both have worked with for uh, Louise, probably the last, the last five years of SOS Foundation. And um, would you uh, please unmute yourself uh, and speak about uh, SOS Foundation, Louise, please. Oh, thank you so much for this opportunity, um, Monty, um, back in 94. I was checking. That's six years going on seven now. So awesome. Thank you so much. You've been a great customer of ours. And this is um, SOS Foundation Repair. Um, SOS Foundation Repair, it's a Christian uh, values uh, based company. So we, we go out to homes and I personally look at it as if I'm, I'm uh, going to do an estimate for my own mother. So we draw the house, we check the altitudes, and then based on the elevations, we determine where the home needs to be uh, braced. However, we also look at other contexts such as drainage and um, you know, maybe the home's been remodeled so it may only need to be stabilized or did it have piers there before so it doesn't need anything anymore. So, um, the evaluations we do are free. Um, Texas um, shifting soils sometimes create some uh, little bit of uh, expansion, you know, with the moist and it creates uh, swell. So sometimes cracks in a house may be normal shifting. That's another thing we uh, like to see and help you understand how that works. Um, 
Monty, I don't know how much time I got. No, you got like five. You got five minutes, uh, Luis. Five. Okay, so it's been <laughs> one. Uh, so let me give you a couple of other things really quick. I usually tell my customers that when a uh, when a home level, it's um, maybe zero right here where my pointer's at. And it drops down, say one inch is really that much, but for the sake of argument, I usually say that this would, you know, imagine that's an inch just to magnify it. What happens with the wall outside is that it tilts towards, you know, like a 90 degree. So that whole thing, when it comes out like this, the wall outside looks like it's falling out. And it starts pushing a facial board on the corners, you know, because it's, it's trying to go out like this. Sometimes you have like a soffit and what it does is it creates a belly, you know, the, the, the wall can push, cannot push out. So it creates a belly. So you see a straight crack all across the brick outside and you wonder why it's because it's, it's a belly towards, you know, the outside. So the levels help us determine if it needs lifting there. Um, and last but not least, um, I, I, I always uh, come across a few realtors who uh, call us for an inspection and uh, the house needs nothing, or we give them an estimate and uh, they, they never use us. So they start feeling bad about it because they, they, you know, they don't wanna waste my time. I want you to erase that from your head because it's never a waste of time to help you. It's never a waste of time to help that home buyer understand whether or not this is a good investment for them. And you know, if we um, if we want to do it for the money, we don't care about those things. But when we do it for the customer, it, the customer will it will be able to see. And I tell you. There was a, a house that was all over the place. It was a, a slab on grade. And to me, that meant a lot of water underneath the house. You know, check the plumbing before. Um, she, she was saying that they were going to buy the house and uh, repair it. And when the mm -hmm. house, um, after the repairs, um, they were going to close on the house because they couldn't get a loan on it. I said, don't do that. And she did it anyway. Um, there was a stipulation on the contract that if they don't go through with the sale, that they would get their money back for the foundation. But they did it anyways. But the thing I said to her was, if you don't check the plumbing right now um, and we fix the foundation, you could be spending a lot of money on plumbing. Well, they approved the loan. She got into a house. We fixed the foundation. and uh, the But the the, the plumbing was about $30,000 worth of repiping. So she was crying. Her husband didn't know what to do. They actually found another loan somewhere else to fix that, but that's not the right approach. So I think the best thing to do for your customers is let them do their due diligence when they're buying a house in their, in their option period. Um, uh, when I bought this house, the realtor wanted, I, I had to fire a realtor because she was looking out for herself. And I was making sure that there was, the investment was the right thing to do. So every time I ask and I send a, somebody to do a pressure test before we buy the house, but, well, you know, this is not the right, I, I don't know anything, lady. You know, don't assume that I know just because I'm a contractor. Please help me. I'm hiring you to help me, you know. And I'm, I want to get my inspections done before I make a decision on this house. And um, so then the next uh, realtor helped me um, so much with um, not, not only answering my questions, but allowing me to do all my due diligence before I went into this investment because it's, it, it, it would be very hard on us if we made the wrong choice. So when we go out to see a house for foundation inspections, we look at it as if my own mother was buying the house, <clears throat> but we also look at it as if my own mother was selling it. So you gotta really understand that we, we we cannot take sides. We some home sellers say, "Oh, that crack's been there all the time since I bought the house," and I just say, "Well, it shouldn't have been there. You know that the crack should not be there. The house needs repair, uh, unless it already 
high. But most of the time, and Monty knows this since 94, that we, um, I'm sorry, 2014, uh, um, the, the, the fact that the, some homes don't need anything. And they're really old homes. Hey, look, this house doesn't need anything, Monty. I'm like, oh, thank you. So uh, please understand that we're only out there to see what the house needs. We don't care if you choose us or not. What happens here is that the, the, some things are out of the realtor's hands. So we know that the choice is gonna be made by either the buyer or the seller. So we only provide you with the estimate to help you, uh, help them make a decision. Um, and, and we really are not out there to try to make a sale. So please understand that. Know that we're here to call me 10 times if you want. Uh, we ask that you make the appointment maybe a day or two before. You don't, don't go, we're running out of option period. It's Friday, can you come today? <laughs> I got a meeting at 10 o'clock with Monty Brown. You know, I'm not gonna stand everybody up. And, 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 and I got a schedule for the rest of the day as well. So, uh, so please help me on that. If you guys uh, call the office. You mind, Luis, you mind putting your information into the chat so everyone else can have it. Um, guys, I've worked with Luis probably the last five, six years. He's my go-to contractor. He, he, he's done the work at my own personal house. Uh, I've had eight foundation companies out there and I always try to leave Luis and I always go back to him. He's one of them guys you can't really get rid of. <laughs> but I recommend him, guys. Thank you. So, yeah, so you don't have to hey, inbox, put your stuff in the um, in the messenger, Luis, so we can reach out to you oh. and, and in the chat, put your information so the group can reach out to you uh, if they need, have clients or even need foundation work on their own personal house. Now, the one thing I want you guys to do is make sure you refer Luis, he gets paid. Please, if you do not, I say, I want to make sure there's no breakup with, if you refer him. He's my go-to guy, and I'm I'm skeptical of sending people I do business with out to my to my peers. I want to make sure you guys take care of Louise if your client is working. If you have a, if you, your client is, is questionable, don't refer Louise. But um, he can't afford to hit. He's a small business foundation company. He can't afford it. So I'm going to vouch for Louise. And I want you guys to use him as your, he's very reasonable. He's a go-to person. And I don't have anything bad to say about the work and quality that we've done for the last, for me for the last five years. So, um, <laughs> so guys, uh, reach out to Louise. Um, Thank you. I appreciate, thanks for taking the time out uh, to, to come to the panel, uh, Louise. Next up, I have uh, Jimmy Porch. He, the guy he's been already so, unmuted. He's been so busy, he hadn't had a chance to come back to, to our meeting. But that's good. That means he's making money. <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy's also a, a realtor, and he came to the meeting last year. He got involved last year. But uh, Jimmy is definitely uh, a roofing company uh, of the people, by the people, and I've used him before. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Jimmy. Well, good morning and, and happy holidays to everyone. And you know, my name is Jimmy Porch, and I'm with Myriad Roofing. And we specialize in both commercial and residential roof repairs and replacements. I'd say that in terms of the, um, the mix, we do probably about 60% commercial, 40% uh, residential. Um, when it comes to residential roofing, um, as I said, you know, we specialize in all types of repairs um, as well as replacements. Um, you know, in terms of our company, what we do is we sit down with the, um, with the, the homeowner to educate them on a roofing system. Um, in order to get a warranty, um, there's certain requirements that are needed on the roof. Oftentimes we see the shingles and that's it. And some roofers will tell you that you have a warranted roof. And in fact, you don't. I've been on several roofs, especially in the Southern sector. I'm talking, you know, Duncanville, DeSoto, uh, Lancaster, where you have roofers who come in and they sh they'll tell you that you have a warranty and we've gotten on the roofs and you don't. And so I, I guess our claim to fame in terms of our business is that we sit down with each and every homeowner to educate and show them the entire system and how your, how your roof is warranted. Um, Myriad Roofing provides a, a 10 year labor warranty on all roof replacements and a 50 year on all shingles. 
Um, if you have any, you know, buyers or sellers that are having issues on their home inspection reports as it relates to possible repairs or replacements, um, don't hesitate to give me a call. Um, you know, we've done um, several projects with various roofers in the organization where they'll call and, and say, Jimmy, hey, I'm in a situation where we got to get this roof replaced um, within a few days. And we've been able to execute and deploy our teams to, to get the, the roofs completed. So if you have any you know, questions, um, don't hesitate to, to give us a call. We do uh, free inspections. Um, if you want an in-depth inspection, there's a, there's a fee associated with that because basically what we do is we provide you a, an inspection that goes from A to Z in addition to that with photos and recommendations. Um, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me. Um, we're all about you know, supporting, supporting um, various organizations um, through for philanthropic um, efforts. So if there's ever any opportunities out there where you need a roofing company to come in and sponsor some other activities, don't hesitate to give me a call. Okay, appreciate it, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy is also somebody, don't call him unless you, uh, <laughs> your people are serious about the roof. Uh, I recommend Jimmy uh, to the group as far as the work, his quality and being there uh, to make sure the job is done. But uh, you know, Jim is also a small roofing company, so he can't take the hit, guys, if your client's not serious. So think about along that line. So I'm extending Jimmy out to the group. My name's on the line. So, uh, <laughs> I'll, you know, and that's how that's what it boils down in the leadership position. Uh, NARAB, we all family. And at the same time, whatever quality of works you, that, that we put out, it represents not just you, us. So think along that line when we – collaborate and we work together in the, in, in the group as well. All right. All right, guys, we're moving along. Thanks, Jimmy, for uh, definitely coming aboard. And uh, we do need sponsors. Uh, and it's also time for us to re-up for our membership going toward for next year. So you guys jump on narabdollars.com or .org and register for membership. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the board members uh, about trying to register, making sure you are financial or in good standing with NARAB Dallas, because uh, we've already uh, have our calendar events. Only thing we need now are sponsors to come along to introduce themselves and, and let us uh, work among our communities to support us by us in a sense. So uh, next up, I have our first VP. Mr. Stephen Lewis, and he'll be moderating uh, the buying back to block. Go ahead and unmute Mr. Lewis, uh, Courtney. All right. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so thank you, uh, President Monty. Yes, we have a, a great, a great, great, great. I just got to keep saying great. Um, panel discussion here, buying back the block. Obviously, we're, we're getting ready to hit a time in real estate where we don't, we don't know what the outcome of 2021 is going to look like, but we have the, the ability to, to provide effective change on the way we see growth opportunities and real estate investment uh, connections in terms of what we can do together and uh, really play off the knowledge that we gain from this buying back the block. I got a great panelist. Of people, we have, uh, we, as you see there, Diane Ragsdale, uh, Christopher Senegal, Paul Lewis Sr., uh, who's actually my dad, and then Antonio Everett. So I just want to introduce each of our panelists uh, here, and I'm going to be your moderator uh, for today. So the first one we have is Diane Ragsdale. Diane Ragsdale is a South Dallas native. Uh, she's the founder of South Dallas Fair Park Inner Cities Community Development Corporation, better known as ICDC, which was founded in 1986 and has been the managing director of ICDC since 2004. You know, under her leadership, the South Dallas Fair Park Inner City Community Development continues its mission of building uh, lives and revitalizing neighborhoods with several ongoing initiatives. Uh, so she's been building over 250 homes, providing much needed 
home ownership opportunities, purchasing and revitalizing a retail center, introducing low income inner city youth to the to the possibilities of business ownership as a viable career path. Uh, she's been mentored by the late civil rights pioneer and the Dallas City Council member Juanita Kraft. Uh, so uh, Ms. Raddell's civic involvement began as a member of the NAACP Youth Council. Moving from appointed to elected office as a member of the Dallas City Council, Ms. Ragdale continued to be a staunch advocate for planned economic development and neighborhood self-determination. In addition to ICDC, Ms. Ragdale has helped, found, helped to found numerous community-based organizations, including the Martin Luther King Junior Community Health Center and Common Ground Economic Development Corporation, Ms. Radels continues to live in sunny South Dallas and is a strong organizer for community self-determination through education, mobilization, and organization. So that's Dallas's own, Di Ms. Diane Ragsdale. Thank uh, you. The second person we have here is uh, Mr. Chris Senegal. Ms. Chris Senegal, that's actually one of my, one of my fraternity brothers that I'm happy to be on, have to have on this panel. So Chris is a degree civil engineer. He's based out of the Houston, Texas area. He's a real estate residential experience. His real estate residential experience began in 2008 as a single family flipper and rental property owner. In 2013, Chris started Invictus Development Group to focus on revitalizing uh, disinvested communities. He has been featured in several major news outlets for his efforts to bring moderately priced single family development back to the community that's once thrived, but now have a but now have a low income housing focus. His goal is to bring higher income back to these communities from the suburbs so that the neighborhood becomes more attractive for business opportunities. So his business, the Invectus Development Group, focuses on a zero displacement model. The, the approach is to only build new construction over abandoned, blighted, nuances properties or commercial properties that are prime for the change for use. Chris has been featured in uh, the Houston area, Cron, ABC News, Yahoo News, Blavity News, uh, and DefendersNetwork.com and, and amongst others. So we happy to have uh, Chris Senegal with us today. Uh, the next person that we have is, is Paul Lewis. Uh, that last name, Lewis, uh, fits my last name. So he is uh, happy to have Paul. He's, he's my dad. And uh, Paul has a remarkable, uh, successful real estate investor uh, over 30 years. So 30 years worth of experience. He has purchased, rented, built, and sold over 200 homes and vacant lots and continues today to build his investment portfolio. He's received training for some of the greatest real estate icons, such as Ron LeGrant, Carlton Sheets, and Russ Whitley. Uh, he's also been a collaborator and have worked with and consulted with the late Ken D'Angelo, who launched the hugely successful and home and home investors, better known as We Buy Ugly Homes. In 1997, he was presented with the coveted quest for success by the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce uh, for his achievement as a successful real estate entrepreneur. Back in 1997, he ventured into the mortgage industry and, and created a successful brokerage, better known as Jubilee Mortgage Lending, and became the only African-American in Dallas Metro with a Federal Housing Administration direct endorsement, which is at DE. Uh, back in 2005, his passion for serving others led to the start of a real estate investment training group, which has led him to train over 500 real estate investors who many uh, are still active today as a re in the real estate industry. He served as the past president of the Dallas Association of Real Estate Brokers, which is our, our organization, and has served as the board of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers on a national level. He's the current president and CEO of PCP Development and Investment Firm and is the managing partner of RPL Properties, where he builds homes to low to, uh, low to moderate income families. Uh, he's uh, he attends Concord Church as a uh, as a Christ believer and has worshiped over uh, OCBF for the last 30 years. He has been blessed with a beautiful wife, my my mom. And uh, <laughs> and and he has a total of three, three kids, three boys. So uh, we we happy to have him as part of uh, as part of this as well. 
and Mr. Antonio Everett. Uh, man, Mr. Antonio Everett goes back to working with NACA. I personally worked with him as a, as a NACA counselor uh, a few years ago. But uh, happy to have Antonio ever join this discussion on this panel here. He's been a real estate uh, agent uh, for the last two, since 2006. He's actually a broker as well, uh, working with first time home buyers. He owns four plexes and duplexes right here in the city. He has done so many purchase transactions that he has an eye for property conditions and budget for repairs. He's going to talk a lot about a lot about his interest on on wealth creation through various sources of, of banks and hard money aspirations. Uh, he, he, he invests in multifamilies and uh, he, he would love to say that his, that his books that he's currently reading uh, or have read and helped him grow is really that think and grow rich. And uh, when you have owned ownership, when you have owned a home you, uh, and for Antonio's efforts, uh, he would like to say for all the incoming projects that he's invested in, he really has an interest to help people save, 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 and keep their credit in order. So I'm going to be able to, uh, we have to have Antonio Everett on this call as well, on this panelist discussion. And guys, I think we got a great list of four strong people. Let me go ahead. And, and, and also, Antonio has been uh, been my partner on some invest, on quite a few investment deals. He is an HBCU grad from Arkansas Pine Bluff. He is my fraternity brother. And uh, you know, me and, and me and Antonio he created a relationship almost what seven years ago on our first initial project. And from there, he's also invested in the southern sector with two businesses as, as well. So the one thing I want you to just to to, to uh, innovate is we got trendsetters and people who are actually involved in the community, regardless of the market. They have sustained and continue, and that's what real estate is about. And um, and I, we put together this panel, and I appreciate my board that threw their favorite picks out here. So we don't have enough time. This can be a two day event with these people that's on this panel. So it, we only got thirty minutes. So you can you can drill in, ask questions, and maybe they'll share their their number with you, and uh, they don't charge you too much after the fact. But have your way, uh, Mr. Lewis, President Lewis. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was somebody about to say something? No, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought okay. you were no, Go ahead. Yeah, so guys, so I got a list of questions here that, uh, that I'm going to ask you individually. Uh, and so, um, you know, un we have your phone unmuted as we, uh, as you're, as we uh, look forward to hearing your, your, your answers. So uh, this question that I have right here is for uh, really Chris Senegal. I want we want to learn, Chris. How did you learn your investing or development skills? Can can you share that? Uh, mentorship, uh, getting consultants, working with the right people that are already doing it. Uh, I spent the first three or four years trying to figure it out on my own. And I just realized, you know, there's such a learning curve and all these different components that it's better for you just to find somebody that's got the expertise and give them some type of value, whether it's time, energy, effort, connections, whether it's money, uh, that's your shortcut to success in, in any field, really. Um, so that's what helped me get uh, out of the fix and flip into the development uh, stage of things. So yeah, I'm getting ready. I'm hitting another big curve. Yesterday, I closed on a $7 million site that we're gonna do 100, uh, 200 and 75 unit apartment complex on and I'm partnering with gateway development There's a group out of Chicago that's been doing this since uh, the black group all black developers um, and they they've been doing this since 1999 so I'm gonna do the same thing again just reiterate the process learn from the experts man I love you I, man that Chris he's on to some some big things guys so I take that same question and I ask uh, Diane you know how did you learn your investing and development skills Certainly, as Brother Senegal indicated, it has everything to do with mentorship. And to be quite frank with you, I'm a, I'm a mighty Trojan out of James Madison High School and, of course, came out of Dallas Baptist University in nursing, by the way. I practiced nursing for quite a while and then realized that, that, that we have housing in particular as one of the underlying causes of illnesses. And so I wanted to make sure that I move forward to away from the floor, if you will, to the community to begin to address one of the ways to prevent illness. And affordable, decent housing is one of those key ways to prevent illnesses. And so, and so uh, I, uh, I developed a relationship with a real estate uh, uh, commercial banker who is a good friend of mine. He worked for Chase and Comerica. 
taking me on his own. As a matter of fact, he came uh, uh, to ICDC and he, he uh, volunteered his time for a number of years and, and with whom I, I worked. And, 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 uh, and of course, I, I learned uh, from him. So it was really mentorship and then practice. Uh, you cannot be, you know, uh, theory plus practice. And so, uh, and the mentorship. And that's in essence how I learned. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Lewis, I would like to ask that question too. How did you learn your investing and development skills for real well, estate? Well, let me just say, first and foremost, that it's an honor to be a part of this panel and uh, especially with some of the illustrious people that you have here. And uh, especially Diane Rags, I've been knowing her Thank for you, years. Sir. And, uh, and she's been a, just, a, uh, just a phenomenal asset for this community. Thank you for uh, coming. When I, uh, when I first got into the real estate business, it was in 1991. Uh, I uh, was a real estate agent with Century 21 and I developed my uh, listing skills and understanding property values. And if you can understand property values, that, that's the first key in uh, becoming a real estate investor. Because if I always say, you make your money when you purchase the property, but you realize it when you sell. And the key is uh, purchasing it right. And of course, again, along with the group, you know, you got to have someone there that can kind of uh, teach you and hold your hand while you learn the business. And I was blessed to have uh, some really good people behind me. And that, that, was, uh, that was the foundation of uh, the beginning of success in, in, as an investor. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. A Antonio, uh, in addition to, you know, the, your investment and development skills, uh, how long have you been in business? What would you say your, your niche is right now? What did you find out in that, and, and honed in on? Uh, I think I found uh, a lot of stuff through necessity. Uh, working with NACA for so long, uh, being a loan officer and being a real estate agent, I was able to do two to 300 transactions a year as a loan officer and another 50 to 75 as a realtor. And I realized uh, people didn't know what they were getting into and people were getting into a lot of stuff without a lot of protection. So out of necessity, I decided, hey, instead of always finding houses for people and having to deal with the issues, I wanna be the person that can turn over a house to somebody with all the issues already resolved. And then just, you know, coming from Arkansas, uh, I believe in the barter system. I met people like Monty. Monty had people who did contracting work, uh, looking at so many home inspections and walking through so many houses, you just pick up an eye of what's required, what's needed, what the lender's gonna want, and then just being resourceful and finding people who can get those things resolved. So, you know, my investment skills and my desire to do it became, really came from necessity and wanting to serve clients in a better way and to put them in a better situation up front. Understood, thank you, thank you. So there's this thing, there's this quote that I, that I, that I see often, it says, we can go fast by ourselves, but we can go far together. So I asked this question to Chris, how did you build a team uh, for your investment goals? Uh, ne networking really, and looking for industry leaders that are in the community that look like me uh, for my new construction development projects. Um, yeah, from the builder to the mortgage brokers, the insurance company, the real estate broker, uh, real estate agents, they're all, they all look like us and they're all high performing. It's not just bringing people to the table just to have them at the table. They have to actually be able to perform. It has to be more than just a social mission. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's been working for me. There's a lot of networking, you know, not everybody works out, not everybody has the same approach to things. So you, you kind of weed through a little bit of that. But yeah, it's really just about communication and talking to people and making sure you, you, you run through enough different resources until you find the right fit for you. Understood. And, and Paul Lewis, I asked you that same question. Uh, you know, how did you go about building a team and, and what is that, what does that process look like? Well, what I uh, look for is passion. I want to make sure that, uh, that the people that I have working with me also have the same passion that I have for the industry. To me, this is, uh, this is something that, that I get excited about even right now. I've been in the business over 35 years huh. and every morning I, I can't wait to get to work because real estate has, it's, it's not a job. It, it's, it's uh, it, to me, I could, I could almost do it for free because I have such a passion in serving this community. And, and I love to see deals come together. 
And so what I look for is that same, um, that same mindset with other people. And if they have a passion for the business and they're skilled at what they do, then uh, especially in areas that we're looking for, uh, then I, uh, I, wanna, I want them to be associated with our team. Thank you. Thank you. And Diane, with your approach to, you know, really successfully taking ICDC to a whole nother level, you know, in terms of that, what would you say that has allowed you to build a, a team? What did you look for in order to take your, your advancing skills to that next level? Well, first of all, you have to share the same values. Uh, you have to have guiding principles. And, and as indicated in my bio, one of the guiding principles uh, is self-determination and that you must believe that we as a people need to determine the direction of our community. We need to determine the direction uh, of our lives. So we got to have common guiding principles. And one of those, uh, as Brother Lewis just indicated, uh, you know, I, I look for passion. I mean, you know, people got to be passionate. And sometimes this is difficult work. And, and so, um, I mean, they were things not going to go your way, you know what I mean? So, I, I, and people sometimes are impatient, et cetera. And so, especially, uh, to be quite honest with you, when you're serving low to moderate income families, you know, the things are not moving as fast as you desire. Uh, and so, and sometimes, uh, for example, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we pre-sale. And so, sometimes the, the buyers fall out. Uh, and so, so, so that's a reality. But but you got to have uh, principles. And, and so and so we're talking about self determination. And we're talking about uh, passion. Uh, uh, and, and also in a real fundamental way, you got to love people. Do you love people? And so and so and and uh, and so that's very critical. Um, I, I've noticed too where, where normally when when I've had to find a way to terminate somebody, and I do find ways to terminate people, and 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 and, and usually sometimes that's all about uh, uh, they don't love people, and then they find themselves since we're since we're serving low to moderate income families, they are very they can be very judgmental, and we got to be careful about that, and they can be very elitist, and so we got to be very careful. Why don't they do this? Why don't they get up? That, you know, hold up a minute now. You know, God's gonna take care of that, etc. And so, but, but they can be very elitist and, and they can be very judgmental. And, and I've become very concerned about that because we don't know what people are experiencing day to day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. You know, you have to have that passion, which is critical in the service that we're, that we're doing. And so to drive on that really makes things a lot easier and you can be able to educate and coach someone to the next level. That's so correct. Antonio... Antonio, I ask you, um, so what are some of your best real estate investment strategies? I like this question because now we're sort of picking uh, and gleaning from you and, and sort of your knowledge that, you know, we can't read all the books you read, you know, but we but this opportunity right now is where you can really, you know, show us, um, you know, how we can take some of what you know and, and apply it to our daily uh, aspirations. Um. The strategies always depend on the clientele. Everybody has a different skill set. Some people have uh, different vari uh, variations of resources. So it, it really depends on the person. Uh, me personally, I got involved and I started buying single family homes and I realized that wasn't the path I wanted to go down because um, it's just too much turnover, too much work on one property, too much liability. And what I realized is for me, it was better to invest in multifamily properties. The reason is because of the liabilities. If I have like, what are my fourplexes? I have one roof, one foundation, one tax bill, one insurance bill. If I had four houses, I would have four roofs, four foundations, four tax bills, four insurance bills. So consolidation was a better investment for me. Um, and then just saving money. You know, it all comes down to your ability to buy. Uh, a lot of people who are getting started, who are younger, I tell them, hey, let's go buy the investment property first. You go buy the investment property first. Now we can get you an FHA loan, conventional loan at three to five percent down instead of a investment loan that's going to be 20 percent down. So I tell younger clientele and people who are getting started, hey, let's go buy the investment property, live in it a year, do what we have to do. And then you can buy the home you want to live in at, at, in another 
begin in another first time buyer loan, 3%, 5%. And now you didn't have to put 20% down. So it always depends on analyzing the person you're dealing with. It's not going to be a general way to, for everybody to do it. You know, some people are married, they have more resources, they can put 20% down. Some people can't do that. Some people like single family homes. So really it's just like going to the doctor. They're not gonna tell you what you need to take. They're gonna do a diagnosis. They're gonna find out what's going on, what's your situation, and then format something that's best for you. So, you know, that's what I like. I like the process. Like Mr. Lewis says, I love the process. I love figuring stuff out. I love seeing how it comes together. But at first, when you're dealing with people, it's just finding out where they're at, what resources they have. Do they have the ability to do certain things? What's their financial situation? And then putting forth a plan that they can execute. Thank you, Antonio. Hey, uh, Steven, Chris. No, hey, Stephen. No, yeah. no, I'm going to cut to the chase. I think the group want to know how they come up with this, with the money. <laughs> oh, that's well, hard. They want well, well, to cut to the chase how they find the money. What, hey, well, that's well the Monty, we have, we have that in here. We have that built in here. So right. really, and, and Chris, that's my, and I want to get to Chris on this. Uh, so, Chris, how do you come up with the funding of your projects? I know Antonio really kind of talked a little bit about uh, about that. But, uh, Chris, I want to ask you because I know that, you know, uh, that you have a lot of exotic things going on. And you just talking about a $7 million deal, partner up with a group in Chicago. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you come up with the funding of your projects. Yeah, here. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry, I didn't have my mute off. Yeah, so great question. So yeah, um, especially in our historically black neighborhoods, which there's a lot of disinvestment. The financial institutions like the banks don't really see the value. They're not going to give you the loans. So what I had to start doing was get, get creative. Um, what I do is I look for contiguous parcels of land, like entire blocks, owned by a single individual. Where I can convince them to own or finance the property to me. So, so I get seller financing between ten and fifty percent down. I raise the, the money from my investor pool. To take the property down and then uh, what i do sometimes is i like on my new construction project i had this the uh, the seller release the lien for the loan and then we convert it over to a joint venture agreement where he now gets paid as i sell each house and i can now go to the bank and say hey i have this property with with no debt on it, and i can use it as equity to get my construction loan so i've done that um, on another project I'm, I'm sitting in a building right now it's built in 1925 uh, and it came with a portfolio of 19 other properties some of these residents in the regular houses back there have been there 19 20 years um, i was able to negotiate a seller finance on this deal and i did a crowdfund so regulation c of crowdfund you could raise a million seventy thousand um, i did that uh, started it this time last year it closed out in july uh, 1,500 investors investing between $250 and $10,000. Everybody has equity ownership in this. We don't have to wait for LeBron. We don't have to wait for Oprah. We can do these things in our communities. Um, all my tenants are happy, completely renovated the properties. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, those are my two smaller deals. For the larger deal, um, I did. I, I was able to get financing because it's right at the intersection of uh, I-10 and 59, uh, right by Minnie Mae Park, right next to downtown. There's a lot of redevelopment going on in that area. So I was able to go to a Texas Citizens Bank, um, talk directly with the president. They gave me a $4.3 million loan. Uh, I raised capital uh, with allowing people to invest $50,000 to $100,000 through Opportunity Zone structure. And then I actually had the, the, the church take a seller second for a little less than a million dollars to close the gap on a total purchase price of $6.75 million plus closing costs, which brought it up, brought it up to about $7 million. Mm, mm. Man, that's that's good, man. That's excellent. That's excellent. You, one thing that one thing that Chris mentioned that stood out to me. He talked about crowdfunding. He talked about getting others involved. He, you know, he realized that you know I can only do so much, but I, I can. But the power of the people is how we can really invest and make change together. And so, uh, Paul, I asked you that same question. You know, how did you come up with the funding of your projects? Because everybody has a backstory. Right. Well, let me let me just say, most people don't start off that large. They start off with one single family home. And, and the key is the purchase price. The funding is the, the easy part it, because everybody wants to invest in a project that that's going to make money. And so if you've uh, worked with a motivated seller, and, and again, the, where I see people fail, especially getting started in the real estate industry, is that they fail to work with people that are uh, motivated or are really in need of, uh, of, of selling. 
And uh, so if you get the property at, at a great price, and I'm talking about 40, 50, 60 percent below the market, you're going to have investors hanging around that would like to fund that deal for you. Now, of course, again, they might charge you 2 percent, I mean, 12 percent or uh, two or three points on top of that. But but again, the key is, is getting started. Uh, I had a guy to back me when I first got in the business. He put up fifty thousand dollars. I bought the property for fifty thousand, remodeled it, and uh, sold it for about one hundred and twenty thousand. I gave him eighteen percent interest and uh, two thousand dollars on each deal. We did that a number of times until he said, "Paul, look, uh, I want to put about a million dollars into you, into the into your business." And uh, you know, before it was all said and done, he had about three million. And once the bank had a chance to see my track record, they said, well, look, hey, you no longer need this gentleman. We're going to back yourself because what are the banks in the business for? To make money. And so everybody's always looking for an opportunity to make money. The investors are there. The key is, do you have a deal that, that can make money? So if you can find that particular deal, you'll get the funding for it. That's no, I mean, I'll, I'll put up the money for you if it can make money. That's the key. Diane, I asked that same question with you. Um, can you share about, you know, your your funding opportunities and what you did? Well, first of all, um, ICDC is community-based nonprofit, a CDC, Community Development Corporation, um, and uh, we we acquire public funding and we also acquire private funding, meaning from lending institutions. And you're absolutely correct. People are looking for. Uh, a deal that they can finance because we leverage uh, the Community Reinvestment Act. And so we hold banks accountable. We, we just don't, you know, drive by a bank. You know, so we, we insist upon them being held accountable. We just don't put our money in a bank. We insist upon the lending institutions being held accountable. So we leverage the, the, the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, uh, and of course, the banks are oftentimes looking not only for a good deal, uh, but if, along with the good deal, they will aggressively pursue you because they want to make, they want to have, the, they need to get the credits, if you will. They need to get the uh, 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 the, the the pluses. They, they, they need to get, they need to, help, they need to make sure that they are following the federal law. And so, and so, I'm hoping that even under this new leadership that we will be able to strengthen the CRA, okay, which I believe we will. We have already begun from a national level because I'm a part of a, ICDC is a part of a national coalition. And matter of fact, I really think the NARAB need to be a part of this movement, uh, the community reinvestment movement, because, because that holds lending institutions accountable to move forward. So, but anyway, I'm just saying public dollars, but also private dollars. Yes, you can have a deal but at the same, but the bank wants to wants to pursue you uh, 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 to, in essence, invest in that deal in order for them uh, uh, to receive their CRA credit. And the, and and the reason that they want the CRA credit is because of the CRA law, the Community Reinvestment Act. And so we need to co we need to connect those things better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. You mentioned about opportunity zones. You know, I know we hear that often uh, in terms of, you know, what that can do. Uh, can you share a little bit about Opportunity Zones and, and leveraging that? Sure. So Opportunity Zones, um, it, it was, it, it's a, a tax vehicle really for those people that have capital gains to be able to defer their tax liabilities for seven years. And then anything they invest in in the community, it's a business um, or, it's a, uh, or it's a real estate transaction. Uh, they can they, they can have to hold it for 10 years. And if they do, all the profits on everything they do in that 10-year cycle uh, is tax-free. All the cash flow, uh, all the, the sale and the profits at the exit, all, all tax-free. Um, but, you know, a lot of us thought that it was something that we could really benefit from personally. But for the games, if you don't have a business that you sold, if, you, if you're not cashing in stocks, you really can't di directly participate to benefit. Uh, the way you can benefit, however, is to get those people to invest in you start your own fund, have them invest their capital gains into the projects. And like I said, they have to stay in for 10 years. Um, a lot of times what they'll do is uh, they'll, they'll buy equity in the deal and then you can refinance uh, your project to stabilize 
uh, so they can actually get recapitalized, get their money back and stay in the project. Um, but yeah, so that that's in a nutshell. If you have any questions, I can answer them. Let's... Got it. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate hey, it. Thank hey, you very hey, much. Hey, yeah. hey Steven. Steven. Go uh, ahead, Monty. Our, our meeting on go is, I'm going to let, let your group know. Our meeting's going to run to like 10, 1030. I want to, uh, I, I, I know everybody want to ask these guys a couple questions, but uh, I want Antonio to uh, mention, he's in the Opportunity Zone with two two places uh talk about that but and i also want the um the panelists they don't mind sharing information and if you guys have a couple questions can you put them put the the, the question you have inside the chat box so stevie can read them so we got about another 10 more minutes uh antonio next and yep and, uh, and the question go ahead antonio okay um i wanted to touch on the uh acquisition of capital real quick first too as well um yeah go ahead i i worked in banking um, chase my first seven years before I got into real estate and people want to invest in people who invested in themselves you know if you hadn't saved any money if you hadn't taken care of your credit you've shown basically you're not committed to being successful so people are going to invest in people who have invested in themselves credit wise saving money uh, becoming resourceful learning a skill set so to acquire money you have to show yourself to be successful you know Saving, save, save, save. Because my first few deals, I had to use hard money lenders. I couldn't go into the bank. Um, so I used hard money lenders. And I, me and Money joked about it. You know, I saved my coins. I'm from Arkansas. I thought it was a big amount of money. And I called my first hard money lender. And he was like, hey, you need to have this kind of money before I do a deal. And I waited another year. I saved my money. I found partners. And I started investing. But I realized people will invest in people who have invested in themselves. Same thing with the bank. The deal needs to make sense, but the people they're dealing with need to make sense too. Um, as far as me, I own uh, two bars and I'm in the Opportunity Zone. I'm in the South Dallas area in Fair Park. And um, it's a new director of the city of Dallas, Zaren Gracie, excellent brother, not only because he's a capital, but also because he went to the <laughs> University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. He's <laughs> with the South Dallas Trust Fund uh, they have grants available. They have loans available for people who are willing to invest in those areas and start businesses. So there are a lot of tax avail, uh benefits, but there are also hardcore dollars that are available in these community uh, development areas for people who are interested in bringing businesses to those areas. Uh, I've just got my application filled out for one of my locations. And they have grant funds that are not required to be paid back available, as well as loans uh, for people who are in, uh, interested in investing in those areas. Thank that's you, Antonio. Right, and that's that public dollar I was talking about. That's what Antonio was talking about, the public dollars. And I need to pat myself on the back. The trust fund was created by me when I was a member of the Dallas City Council in 1988. So, and it's still being used. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your service. <laughs> thank you. I, I need to put that out there. All right, thank you. No, we appreciate it. And, and Diane, I really want you to touch on um, a lot of that as well with the Opportunity Zone. Um, you know, I, I know that you have a, a real a real keen understanding having worked as with the Community Development Corporation. So can you share your knowledge on that as well? Well, I tell you what, like, like Brother uh, Senegal indicate, indicated, it, it's more than a notion to try to, uh, uh, you know, to try to move people to to invest uh, uh, in, in the uh, in our community. Nevertheless, we, we just need to acknowledge that. And of course, even though the tax liability can be deferred, uh, and so, uh, and and. and uh, and so we really, to, to some extent, have not been successful related to the opportunity zone. Part of, part of the area around Fair Park is indeed uh, uh, an opportunity zone. It's indeed uh, within an opportunity zone. So, and so we, we, have not, um, uh, uh, we have not leveraged that opportunity yet because it's, it's, it's just right now, it's, it's not, to be quite frank with you, right now it's not serving us. Uh, it is not an entity that that we could very well or a tool that that we can use that'll be a part of our toolbox because it is it is it is difficult uh, for uh, for for uh, small uh, for profit as well as nonprofit 
Uh, I do want to say, uh, uh, however, though, uh, that that whole issue of uh, partnerships leverage impact. I mean, that we got to rec recognize that. I mean, talking about working together, partnerships leverage impact. And so we got to learn to trust one another, to work together, the crowdfunding, et cetera. And oftentimes we don't. I mean, I live in the heart of the hood. I live in a, in a neighborhood real quickly that's called Wheatley Place. And I live on, 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 on a street called Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And, and, and right now it's about 60% Latino because they have acquired the older houses, they have renovated them, et cetera. And so, and so, what, so what we really need to do is, is to invest in our old communities in order to help return uh, some of our neighbors. So anyway, I didn't want to deviate, but, but with respect to the Opportunity Zone, we, we have looked at it and we've pursued it and we've walked away. Hey, uh, one question that someone had that had wants to know: Do you guys uh, know anything or invest in mobile homes? Anyone on the panel? What did you say? Has anyone invested in mobile homes? They won't had a question about mobile homes or mobile home parks. Mobile home parks. Mm -mm. I haven't. No, I haven't. But I, I mean, I have friends that do. I mean, it's in, it's like any other area, real estate. You know, you're you're either vast, you're either investing for value appreciation or you're investing for cash flow. If you actually own the, the park and the pads, then you have value appreciation. However, the mobile homes themselves depreciate, but they do have very strong cash flow. Um, so it, just, it really just gonna depend on your investing model. Um, but I mean, it's definitely a feasible route to go. Uh, all right, hey, you guys mind sharing your information in the panel, if you don't mind them reaching out to you. I don't know if anybody charge a consulting fee or whatnot, but uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is the thing NARAB's about, and we, we we got people, our people that are making moves and trendsetters and readjusted the wheel outside of just selling real estate, and so and 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 this is the end game. If you're in this business, you got to have an end game. The end game is not just to be a realtor and sell a bunch of houses. The end game is is the, is ownership. If you're a realtor, a realtist, and you're not investing and letting all the deals go to your investor, or even partner with somebody that's part of NARAB, that's a realtist, let a deal come our way before you send it out in the community. And you know, you don't know who here can make it happen. And, and the thing about it is, we want people investing in NARAB before we start uh, opening our mouth telling you, uh, hey, the, 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 uh, there's a pothole over there. So the key to this NARAB of being realtors is, realtors is you got to invest in us and therefore we will invest in you and then the wheels will start turning. So um, any, anything else, Stephen, before we move to Miss Redwine? Yeah, well, um, I'd like to close it by this because this segment is all about buying back the block. So I want each one to really show how the important uh, or can you give people a, a information how important it is uh, to 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 look at where we are today and the motto of buying back the block. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Paul Lewis. Oh, okay. So you say buying back the block. Correct. And I, I go a little bit further with you because I know that you you know you you got lots from the land bank and you kind of did a whole bunch of things you know to invest into the community. Um, so obviously, looking at certain vehicles that you was a part of, think about that buying back the block uh, in mind. Got it. Well, one of the things that uh, that's always been important to me, and that has been serving our community, and, uh, and especially the low to moderate income uh, side of it. And, and so we're involved in several things. And when we talk about buying back the block, uh, we we were actually we had an acquisition of about 70 lots from the land bank program. Mm -hmm. And we're right now and that was in 2013. And we're right now finishing up our last two lots. And so we've been on a, um, uh, an acquisition um, to uh, acquire more and more lots. And so uh, we're really excited about what we think the future of uh, this community is gonna be, especially in Texas. And next year, we're, we're excited about the market, how strong the economy is. And uh, there's plenty of opportunities out there for investors and builders alike. And, uh, and, and even uh, multifamily ownership. I I'm excited on all, all sides of it. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, I asked that same question to you. Well, first of all, I, um, 
I, I do believe that in order for us to 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 move forward, uh, and I just want to leave this where we got to collectively work together, a, as it has been indicated. But also, um, uh, strict, strict, what, what I call strategic land banking is important. Uh, and many times we've tried to buy on, on corners and also in the middle. Because one of our goals is to prevent gentrification, to prevent displacement. And so we want to be in control of that block. And so, and so when we say control of the block, then, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy this corner lot, I'm going to buy this corner lot, and I'm going to buy in the middle. And so, uh, and so to that end, uh, we, we're just in better control uh, uh, because it's very critical uh, for us to to, if we're talking about the prevention, when we're talking about low to moderate income families, if we don't watch out, I mean, you know, Hall and Thomas at one point in time was for the black middle class. I mean, and they were all run out. And so, and so I'm just saying that we, for low to moderate income families, one of our goals is to prevent uh, displacement. And so therefore we strategically buy lots. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Antonio, can you share please? Okay, I think um, I got a different approach to it now. Um, and it's not even different. I'm looking at retail and entertainment and commercial space. Um, we got a great panel of people who are gonna drive people to the community. And I wanna be able to provide them entertainment, food services when they get there. So not only do we need to invest in where they are gonna live, but people want something to do when they get there. Uh, like I said, I have two bars uh, in the Fair Park area and also working on lease space for a, a restaurant in the area. So, you know, you have to get the people back there and then you have to have something to keep them there and something for them to do. So just as, as important it is to give them somewhere to stay, we also need places that will service these people when they get there. And uh, it takes everybody's and everybody's efforts to make the community work. So um, I applaud everybody on the panel for what they're doing. And, um, you know, we all just need to keep doing our part to, uh, to, to see it realized. Because like Ms. Ragdale said, you know, you need to get the lower income and the middle income back to, to, to sustain a community. You know, uh, you get a community, um, you need families, you need men. And I mean, I think that's the whole, the biggest thing in our community now is uh, you need men in these communities. They sustain the community, they protect the community. And uh, we need to get these families back in the communities. That's good, that's a good approach to that, uh, Antonio. And Chris, I'll leave it to you, that question. Oh, Sorry, guys. I'm, uh, so I'm actually my building, my contract is in here fixing up some little things. So you might hear a hammer in the background. Yeah, so uh, bu buying the block um, is definitely a movement for us to take control of our neighborhoods again. It's not like we never had control because right. before desegregation, we everything was in the community. And while, while we do focus a lot on the lower income folks that did not make it out, my goal is to try to bring the higher income people back in, the ones that look like us out of the suburbs. And so my, my townhouse development, all my buyers are young black working professionals, all six figure earners. Um, you know, now the kids in the neighborhood can see somebody driving an Audi or a Porsche that's not a drug dealer, right? Hmm. Now, now, now the people that live in those houses can go support Antonio and be able to tip the waitresses properly and keep, and keep Antonio's business f flourishing. That's what we need in our neighborhoods. Um, and you know, so everybody can participate in that. The people that are on this stage can, but even just the regular home buyers, the regular person that has no interest in investing in real estate needs to be buying in these communities to, because as they revitalize and as the values go up uh, and you will be gentrification happens, we usually miss that value appreciation. So that's why the net worth of the black household does not go up because we buy in the suburbs where the, the home prices go up one or 2% and neighborhoods and the prices are tripling. You know, that net worth alone changes that whole trajectory of average uh, net worth of the black household. Um, it puts our kids in college for free borrowing against the equity in the house. It's just so many layers to it. So many things that's better if we start buying back our blocks and come again. All right. You guys have. Love this, it. What's so, what's so special about this panel is, is we have a baby boom. We have a couple baby boomers, a Gen, a Gen X and a millennium. <laughs> you got it from three different. You got it from four. <laughs> well, uh, three different angles. I'm the millennium now. <laughs> you guys got different, different generations. So that's what we're that's about. Good. And ARAB is history. 
We've been around since 1947, and this is a collaboration of what's going on. And these are the people we're trying to bring to the, the organization that have still been involved and touching us. So, you know, I commend you guys. I thank you guys for being a part of this panel and taking time out of your money making schedule. And it, and and it, it, and one word that that's missing is success comes with reinventing yourself year after year after year after year. And you know, and 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 I and and uh, when I was in corporate America, uh, uh, an older oh, an older investor said he's happy about eighty. They said, "When are you gonna retire?" And it looks like you guys don't plan on doing it no time soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's passion. Hey, and and that's the key word. Success has a passion to keep you in, to keep you in it. And I appreciate it. Thank you guys. And next up, we have no other than uh, thank you. Thank you. And a great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. And, and I hope you guys took some notes because I did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Ms. Redwine, go Monty. ahead. Okay. Monty. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I just want to mention, uh, we do uh, have a question, but I just want to mention the significance of this organization. Mr. Lewis, would you mind telling people who you bought those 70 lots from? <laughs> well, none other than Matt Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's right. And Ms. Ragsdale, uh, most yeah. of your houses that's been sold the last start. few years. Yeah, that's exactly what most of our homes have been sold by Ms. Pat Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's that's what this this organization is about. That's, it's about, right. that's right. It's it's about the commitment and the people that that are passionate, and that's why Pat's still involved. Uh, Miss <laughs> was still around, and and, and she was and Miss Ragdale was accessible because of uh, Pat Douglas. That's right. That's right. That's right. Passion was what keeps the organization th thriving. So, and that's what this, this is the uh, the person who you don't. Who I innovate and try to make sure to get pointed out. She's behind the scene, guys. So, to making sure that we look good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. I want to ask one before Miss Redwine comes in. Can I ask? Uh, we do our first uh, question real, real quick. Go ahead. Be prepared, prepared y'all, to put it in the chat. This is our. He didn't, he didn't hear my bell a while ago. <laughs> It's Christmas, y'all. This is Christmas. And anybody, anybody can put this in, okay? Be be ready to put it in the chat, y'all. Okay. Oh, yeah, we got a couple of gift cards, a $20 we gift have, card. We have some gift cards. He's going to be sending them out. So, y'all get ready, got, get ready, get ready. Okay, the Federal Housing, Federal Fair Housing Act was founded in what year? The Federal Fair Housing Act was founded in what year? Y'all remember we celebrated. Oh, come on, come on, let me put it there. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Whoever gets in the chat first. Uh, okay, somebody yeah. already responded. Yeah, okay. Uh, already uh, first was uh, Perrette Park. First one is Perrette. Yeah, okay. All right, we can go on. We're going to have some more, so y'all get ready. Next up, Miss <laughs> Redwine. Okay, good morning. Now, um, I want to start by piggybacking on what uh, Miss Ragsdale has shared. And just so everyone knows, uh, Monty is in touch with the National so that we have our pulse on the monies that are going to be distributed and available for first time home buyers while keeping our hands on what is happening as, uh, as pertains to both evictions and foreclosures. So we got to keep our eye on that because it actually impacts everything that's been talked about today. With that said, Ms. Ragsdale was featured in an amazing article that discusses the whole issue of community reinvestment. Everything that was talked about today revolves around the issue of community reinvestment. When we talk about South Dallas and the difficulty with purchasing there, and I've owned homes there myself, hard money lenders have said they will not loan you money if they can see the Ferris wheel from that location. So you keep that in mind. So without the Community Reinvestment Act, it limits the monies that are available. As it is, the profit margins within that community are relatively low because of the challenges faced with getting owner occupants and the issues with the appraisals. So we do need to work diligently with Ms. Ragsdale and I'm hoping that we will so that we can make those changes to the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, with that being said, I wanted to real quickly share with you guys, we had some amazing contractors 
And as we see the moratorium being lifted on foreclosures, we're going to see more properties come available that will need renovations. So I want you to uh, understand that when you are listing a property or you're looking to purchase a property, it is critical. And I mentioned this before, but I'm gonna go over it again, that you speak and work directly with the title company. You need to go to Dallas County, Rome. You need to look at the deed and then you're going to need to work diligently with the title company before you start investing money to ensure that you can get clear title. That is a major problem in the Southern sector. So they often have a transfer of the property within generations, but there are clouds on title that prevent the property from being sold and maximizing um, the amount that is earned on that. So when we're talking about a property that needs renovations, either because it's going to be sold or because the individuals want to live on it, in it, one of the things that you want to do is speak with a contractor that is willing to be paid at closing. Those uh, deals will work provided you have a strong contract. Your title company has already opened title and approved and confirmed that there is clear title. So once you have confirmed, and this will work on any property anywhere, once you know that to be the case, then you can reduce the risk and increase the chance of getting more money for the property by having a contractor who is willing to allow the renovations to be done and to be paid at close. They will need to have, we've talked before about mechanics liens. So this contractor will need to have their paperwork tight, send it to the title company and that will lock it up. Now there is one other thing I wanna mention and that is with the number of investors that have entered the market, you must be sure you're protecting your buyer because if a contractor has done renovations, when you look at the property, if they have a new hot water heater, if they have a new anything, if it looks like there's been work done, it is imperative that you ensure there is a transferable warranty and that you've got proof that this was paid for. If you do not, the new owner could be faced with payment due on the contractor because a title policy does not cover unrecorded liens. We are seeing these issues because of licensees that are unfamiliar with what the law states. The other issue is you must pay attention to the contract which specifically states that we are providing a general warranty deed. However, many contractors are not going to provide a general warranty deed. They are going to provide a special warranty deed. The challenge you face, if you don't pay attention, which most do not, if you're not paying attention to that title, the special warranty deed only covers the time in which the investor owned the property. So if that investor is flipping in three or four months, it's all you have coverage for. So you're standing out there naked. So you need to be attentive. And with that, uh, I'll wrap my chair. Thank you, Ms. Redwine. Uh, you want to get one more gift before we uh, have Mr. Uh... Carter comes in and swears in. Unmute yourself, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> well, to have some conference this year, y'all, <laughs> before we do the uh, installation. Okay, I think we have the wheel ready. Yeah. Y'all want, uh, uh, want to do one more question? Yeah, one more before question. We do, ahead. Before we do the wheel, yes, we'll do the wheel for the last four. How I many did we have? Six. Uh, okay, y'all ready? Yes. Okay, now listen, this is the question, and we'll do we'll do this one. This is the last question, and then the others are gonna be done with the wheel. Okay. All right. NARAB was founded in 1947 in what city? What city was NARAB founded? Ready? Go ahead. Okay, did y'all did y'all get the question? Yeah, they got it. I don't think I, they, just don't know the answer. <laughs> don't know the answer. <laughs> no, no, not Chicago. Somebody said Chicago. Okay, I'll give it. Okay, what well, Monty? You're not supposed to be. Yeah, you, you. Okay, somebody else. <laughs> no, 
Uh, <laughs> Baltimore. <that's where. laughs> Carol, Carol got it. Carol got it. Okay, Carol. Okay, we got Carol Holmes. She won it. All right. We found in Tampa, Florida, y'all. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Carter. You ready to this? Does her have everything you need, Pat, to uh, meet Mr. Carter? I'm mute, Mr. Carter. Yeah, I got uh, you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me introduce Thanks. him. Uh, if some of y'all know him, Mr. Harold Carter, who is currently serving and was just uh, re-elected the uh, vice chair of the board of the uh, NARAB uh, board. Okay, so he is uh, again serving as our uh, vice chair of uh, NARAB board of the NARAB board, Mr. Carter. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Miss Miss Douglas and President Monty Brown. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to, to sit in on your meeting this morning. I sound like I've been sitting in on a Black Wealth Encyclopedia this morning. <laughs> it was great information that was shared. And I want to just tell you, you this chapter is one of 93 other chapters across the United States that's trying to do the same thing about creating Black wealth all across America. And this information just shared was just so enlightening and so uplifting. Uh, we got to have all of you all back somewhere so we can put a history of all this knowledge and information. Also, I see you have some icons on the, on the panel this morning and Mr. Paul Lewis and Cecil and some people whose history goes way back. Mr. Billy Scott, Ms. Douglas, some of the rest of you, Paul Lewis again. As a matter of fact, I started my career right here in this chapter and uh, been your president, been the state president, region and all, but it started right here in this chapter. But more important about this chapter, uh, Ms. Douglas just said in 1947, and they did not have air conditioning cars where we couldn't spend nights in hotels where we couldn't do anything. We had a great visionary from the city of Dallas. Mr. And so right then it started, uh, a, Mr. Maceo Smith helped start the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. We stand on those shoulders today and you should be so proud to be even included in the NARAM Association, National Association of Real Estate Broker because of Mr. Smith. It's a wonderful organization. We're struggling all across the United States to, blame black, to bring black wealth to our community. Buying back the block is one part of it. Investment in the black community is a major, major concern. And as you know, uh, and Ms. Ragsdale just mentioned something with the CRA, it's for a while it didn't even have teeth, but it's gonna have more teeth with the Biden administration. The Biden administration, as a matter of fact, black folks helped elect the president of the United States. And he's not going to forget us and we're not going to let him forget us. So if you will, just stand by and whatever projects you have, opportunity zones, community reinvestment acts, all of those are going to be brought forth with the, with the National Association of Real Estate behind it. But let me, you, you, you brought me in this morning to do something that I have great pleasure in doing. And that's to bringing up other chapters, installing other leaders. And I'm glad to see, Mr. Douglas, we got some young millennials, young realtors, We've been wanting to do this for years. Some of us are getting a little bit tired, but we, we're so happy that we have great shoes, great people to fill our shoes. And I look forward to all of you one day when this pandemic is over, we can all get together in a convention. We can highlight each other and you'll know who's behind you. So when you're out here operating, just remember you have a national association behind you. You have people with similar goals, similar problems, all of us, we're working together for the same goal, which is to uplift the black community. If with that said, again, thank you for letting me have this opportunity to do this. But Mr. Monty Brown, why don't you let me do you individually? But for the other members of the association, uh, we have the first vice president, which you all, uh, you're here, you're present. I looked over your roster. Only somebody I did not see is Ms. Brenda Williams. Is she available? If, if, uh, She's here. She is here. She's okay. Waving. Okay. Well, good. We all we all here. So, if you will, I'm go ahead and uh, repeat the oath. So, that if you will, I'm gonna ask you to state your name, and I'm gonna ask you about the office that you're 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 being elected to. So, but Monty, don't you do it? Let me come back right quick and do you individually. You're the head of this organization, so we got to make sure that 
we all hear you speak as an individual president. So thank you, Mr. Brown, but let's go ahead and get started. If all uh, the officers could unmute themselves. Yeah, would you please? Oh, well, he, he's got a, okay. I see you on the screen, you have a, you have a list of them. I'm not gonna call you off, but I'm just gonna have you just repeat your own name. Is everybody ready? Is everybody yeah. unmuted? Okay, thank you, Mr. Douglas. I state your full name. I, Stephen Lewis. Parkin. Having been elected, state your office. Having been elected as the first vice president. Did all of you repeat your office? Yes, board member. Vice first member. vice president. Parliamentarian. Okay. Do solemnly square. Do solemnly, solemnly square. square. That I will support and defend. That I will, I will support and defend. defend. Constitution and bylaws. Constitution, Constitution and, and bylaws. bylaws. Of the Dallas Association of Realtors. Of, of the, the Dallas, Dallas Association, Association of Realtors. Realtors. Texas Association of Real Estate Brokers. Texas, Texas Association, Association of Real Estate, Estate Brokers. Brokers. National Association of Real Estate Brokers. National, National Association, Association of Real Estate Brokers. Brokers. Now we're bear true faith. I will bear, I will bear true, true faith. faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I take the obligation freely. That I take, I take the obligation, the obligation freely, freely. Without any mental reservation. With any mental purpose of evasion, or purpose, purpose of, of evasion. evasion, and that I will well, and that I will well, and faithfully, and faithfully, faithfully discharge the duties, discharge the duties, the duties of the office, of the office, of the office. Upon which, upon which, upon which, I am about to enter. I am I about, am to, about enter. to enter. So help me God. So help, me, help God. me God. Congratulations. You are officially the directors and the board of directors for the National Association, excuse me, for the Dallas Association of Realtors. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. to you, Mr. Carter. All right, Mr. Brown. All right. This is this is our leader, and I want to encourage everyone to support him in whatever he's doing. Uplift him, uh, undergird him, uh, give him your support. He's out here and he's doing it freely, and he's committed to this organization. We look forward to promoting Mr. Brown all the way to the national office. So, Mr. Brown, if you will, let's begin with your oath. I state your name. I, Monty Brown. Having been elected, having state been the elected, office. Having been elected as NARAP Dallas president. Okay. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution and bylaws. The Constitution and bylaws. Of the Dallas Association of Realtors. Of the Dallas Association of Realtors. The Texas Association of Real Estate Brokers. Texas Association of Real Estate Brokers. And the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I will take this obligation freely. That I will take this obligation freely. Without any, any mental reservation without any mental reservation a purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion and that I will well and I will well and faithfully and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties of the office of the office upon which upon which I am about to enter I am about to enter so help me God. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you your president, 
of the Dallas Association of Mr. Monty Brown. Congratulations, right. Mr. Brown. I appreciate it. Mr. Congratulations, Mr. Brown. Congratulations. The National, the, the National Association is behind Mr. Brown 100%. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Thank Ms. you, Ms. Ms. Douglas. Mr. Carter, you'll have to do the, um, the Women's down. Council also. Is that right, Carol? Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. Hey, uh, Ms. Carol, she, she's been faithfully executing her, her, her duties as president, so she brings before the, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, and we're behind the, the Women's Council also. They are one of our strongest affiliates in the whole uh, organization. So Ms. Brown, I mean, excuse me, Ms. Ms. Holmes, let's let's begin. And uh, I, and state your full name after I say I. I, Carol Holmes. Having been, el been elected, state your office. Having been elected president of Women's Council, Dallas chapter. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend that I will support and defend the Constitution and bylaws, the Constitution and bylaws of the Women's Council of DARAB, of the Women's Council of DARAB, the Dallas Association of Realtors, the Dallas Association of Realtors, the Women's Council, the Women's Council of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. That I will well. That I will well. And faithfully and faithfully discharge the duties discharge the duties of the office of the office upon which upon which i am about to enter i am about to enter so help me god so help me god congratulations miss holmes and ladies and gentlemen i will introduce to you your new president of the women's council the dallas association of real estate brokers miss holmes take your bow Hey, Miss Carter, okay. you got the board. Uh, <laughs> the uh, board. Carol, board. Can board. You, Carol, can Where? you uh, introduce your board? I can. Um, I don't have that list. It's okay. That's why I said that uh, for Carol to introduce them. So um, um, my board is my first vice president, Marty Jeffries. Jeffries. She's waving. My second vice president is Kelly Houston. Great. Awesome. Um, my, where is she? My secretary, Anita Young. Did she jump off? There she is. My assistant secretary, Charmaine Byers. There she is. She heard her name. <laughs> and my treasurer is Jasmine Handsome. Uh, my parliamentarian, Monty Brown. And chaplain. Chris Ziegler, is Chris on? Ziegler. Ziegler. I think Chris jumped off. He may have, he may have. Okay. Yes, Ms. Holmes, I also wanna to extend to you that the National Associated Real Estate Brokers stand behind you 100%. If at any time we can be of service to your organization, we're here to support you and to help you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. I guess next up, we will be doing. Do you want to swear them in, Mr. Carter, or do you have it? Who, who is that? The Women's Council. You want to swear them in as well? The uh, officers. Um, the officers. The officers. Ready? Yeah. Okay. What do I state your full name? I'm uh, Monty Brown. Jasmine Hanson. Right. Having been elected, state your office after you say having been elected. Having been elected. Having been elected treasurer. Okay. Do, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution and bylaws. The Constitution and bylaws. 
of the Women's Council of Dayrab. Of the Women's Council of Dayrab. The, the Dallas Association of Realtors. The Dallas, Dallas Association of Realtors. And the Women's Council. And the Women's, and the women's Council. Council. Of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Of the National, National Association, Association of Real Estate, of Real Estate, Estate Brokers. Brokers. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear, bear true, true faith. faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance, and allegiance to the same. the same. That I will take this obligation freely. That I will take, I will take this, obligation this obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation. Without, without any mental, mental reservation. reservation our purpose of evasion. Our purpose of evasion. And that I will well. And that, that I will, will well. well. And faithfully. And faithfully. And faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge, discharge the duties. Of this, of the office. Of the, of the office, office. Upon which. Upon, upon which, which. I am about to enter. I am about, I'm about to enter. enter. So help me God. So help, so help me help God. me God. Congratulations, board. You all are installed as the Dallas uh, Dallas uh, Women's Council of Dayrap. So thank you for your service, Miss Miss uh, Holmes. You got a crew to work with, and I'm look forward for great things from this from your association. So thank you so much, Miss uh, Douglas, Mr. Brown. It's my pleasure to induct you and your Women's Council today. Please keep up the good work. And we all look forward to work together and making Dallas one of the most successful chapters in the United States. Thank you so much. And everyone, please have a Merry Christmas and be safe. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Carter. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, mm -hmm. Just before we jump into it, um, I just want to make sure I mention my Board of Governors. Um, um, I have Miss Laura Washington as my board chair. Um, I have uh, Deborah Kennedy and Miss Madge Day and Miss Theta Rep. So I just want to make sure I mention those ladies as well. Okay, thank you, um, mm -hmm. Carol. Uh, one more thing, guys. Uh, I know um, we're, we're about to do the wheel with uh, Pat Douglas and then Stevens on prayer. So go ahead, Pat. Have your way. Who's doing the wheel? Hey, can y'all put the wheel up, Courtney? Uh, can you transfer to? Uh, uh, Perrette's going to put it up. Perrette. Perrette is putting it up now. Okay. All right. We ready? All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Everybody clap, everybody clap. Hopefully you win. <laughs> okay. G. Wesley. Wesley. All right. Wesley. Okay, y'all right now. Miss Pat, I'm here. Okay, all right, you're a winner. Hey, hey, hey can, you text, Merry can, Christmas. You guys, can you guys text me your, uh, your mailing address? I'm gonna put my cell phone in the group. So I can make sure I get it in the mail this uh by Monday. Okay, that was number three. We had six, right? Is that uh, right? We have, uh, we have Monday. More. We three have more. more. Okay, we ready. Y'all better clap so you win. Clap, <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready, go, click, go, go. Correct. Click remove. If you click remove, it'll it'll take his name out. And take his name to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we ready. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. 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 Okay, Billy Scott. Scott. Billy Scott, Mr. Scott. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scott. Right. Did you uh, thank you so was much. Was it Mr. Scott? So was it a big, okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, Merry Christmas. All right, next, next, let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> uh, it's a tie. Okay, Tina. Is Miss Tina still on? Yeah, she's still here, but I got her. All right, up next. Who's next? Okay, last but not least, one more. I'm here. Corey. Patricia. Oh, oh, I thought it was me. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> Corey. All right. All right. All right. Thank you all and Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Please be right. safe.
Merry uh, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Somebody we praying. Got, somebody praying to uh, Mr. Lewis. Yes. So Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank Party. you for watching over us, Father God, this day. Lord God, thank you for allowing us to get. Go ahead. You, you muted, Steve. You got muted. Can you? Father God, just thank you. Thank you, God, for just allowing us to be present. Father God, thank you for allowing us to carve out time in our busy schedule, Father God, to, to connect together as one body, Father God, connect together as, as people who aspire to for change in the community. Father God, thank you for this meeting and the panelists. Father God, thank you for the new officers that were, uh, were uh, sworn in, Father God. And we just pray that, pray over our nation, pray over our economy, Father God, as we head into 2021, Father God. Put it on our minds, hearts, and souls to to create something something that's new and 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 heartfelt, Father God. As we look about change in this next season uh, that we're going into, Father God, we know that that you know the forbearance is going to be lifted, Father God, and and that student loans are going to be paid back, Father God. And so we don't know what things will look like in the future, Father God, but there's a group and a body that's here to help and and guide those individuals every step of the way into, this, into their next decision-making process. Uh, God, allow us to connect with individuals, grow our businesses, and grow our businesses uh, to connect with the organization, Father God. And as we lean on each other, as we really lean on each other, Father God, uh, in such a mighty way, Father God, with you in mind for us to create change and affect change. We love you, we thank you. Uh, and we look forward to our return after this uh, lovely holiday, Father God. Uh, and we may not forget the things that you put on our hearts and our souls and what this season means uh, to, be, uh, to be grateful and to be thankful and appreciative, Father God, for what we are. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Nansen uh, is on break, but amen. I do have their yeah. number if anybody would like to write it down to just get on Zoom. Uh, just send it, send it to me in the text, Mr. Scott. And uh, okay, I'm and gonna share, text it to you. And I and I'll share and I'll share with the group. Uh okay. I appreciate you guys for showing up and, and extending us out past an hour and a half for uh this induction. And I'm pretty sure you guys enjoyed the buying back the block because I really enjoyed it. And next month. Uh, me and some of the boys have already planned uh, acts and appraiser. Uh, Mr. Robert Wilson will be uh, telling you guys he 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 will make sure we get that value that, that our client needs next month. So please tune in uh, for next month for Robert Wilson acts and appraiser, and also uh, having Angela Miller uh, talk about 100 financing as well. So. Um, and just to let everybody know, this is the last day of Nash. In this last day, yeah, this last day. And uh, the last session, which will be, I, I understand, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Antoine uh, uh, told us that uh, it's, there can be kind of kind of like entertainment, you know, uh, Jodeci or whoever that is. Whoever, I think somebody, <laughs> Jodeci, I think is going to be. I don't know about all these people, y'all, you know. <laughs> it's going to be on there. So y'all might want to get in on this. Lab. We, we really missed the last, uh, a good one. It was on Land Banks this morning. But uh, Car uh, uh, Loretta had asked them if they were going to uh, have it um, uh, recorded, which they said it would be. So uh, you might want, they, they say what it takes a week or two or something like that, but you might want to get on that, um, you know, uh, uh, go into it. I, I think it's pretty good because of what's going on right now. So if you can get in, get on there, get the, at least this is the last day. So try to at least get, you know, part of it. Okay. And um, real quick, Monty, um, I put in the chat about uh, Women's Council. Marty's doing his uh, vision board Zoom party on the 22nd. I know some of you have been getting emails about that. And then at the one o'clock session for national, um, that's the civic engagement. And Laura has asked me to open the prayer. So y'all come support that. And pray, pray for me as I pray. <laughs> so everyone, so, thank you, Ms. Carol, you and your women. Is it women one or 12? For what uh, you're one. Doing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate you guys as always for staying the course and being a part of this wonderful organization, NARAB, and we're looking forward to 2021. And you guys have a happy holiday and I guess a new year too, because we won't see you till next year. Correct. <laughs> Y'all take care.
Okay. You guys take care right. and be safe. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye-bye.